Governor, tell me, it, it's, it's hard to believe that the 10-year anniversary is coming up since September 11th, 2001. Uh, your life changed, as many Americans' lives did, but your life, life changed dramatically because of that day. Your thoughts on that, 10 years later, all that's happened in your life personally? Well, I must tell you that I've never really thought in terms of just my life because uh, my life was changed modestly as composed as compared to uh, you know the families and the friends of the 3,000 people that lost their lives, uh, uh, that changed the president and the vice president's uh, life dramatically and their families, and it changed America. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, um, we aren't more vulnerable uh, because of 9-11, uh, but we have a, a greater sense of our own vulnerability, and accordingly, that changed how... Uh, uh, some of the things that government does, uh, some of the things that we do, and uh, how we think about uh, this uh, global scourge of terrorism. So uh, did it change my life? Yes, I left uh, a job that I, I loved. I loved being governor, uh, but uh, I was one of the fortunate ones. You know, right after 9-11, President uh, Bush gave me an opportunity to uh, work with him to serve my country, and most Americans were saying, what could I do to help? Well, the president gave me a job, so I'm um, always be grateful for him and uh, for the support I got, not only from him, but uh, from the people who rallied to, uh, uh, to serve the country, many of them who end up, ended up working with me. Well, serving as Secretary of Homeland Security, Director and then Secretary, you traveled the world, traveled our country, even in the days, the weeks, months that followed September 11, 2001. As you've done that over the last 10 years, have you seen any change since then? Is there an easing? Is there a, a different... Uh, mentality of people as you go into small towns or large cities when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to um, the way they live their daily lives? Have people changed over the last 10 years? In my opinion, uh, once we uh, went from bended knee in prayer, and that's exactly what we did right after 9-11, this is a country that uh, it, its sense of vulnerability, that sense of anxiety, uh, but there's also a sense of cohesion, a sense of unity. And over the past 10 years, if we've proven anything to ourselves, it's that we are undeniably resilient. That doesn't mean there haven't been changes that have been affected. I think the biggest change is that uh, the impact of 9-11, the visuals are still in the minds of uh, most people in this country. It has in, in affected our DNA, uh, but I think by and large, by and large, uh, people have accepted that there's a, it's a new norm in terms of threats to our sovereignty and our value system, just like the, during the Cold War. The norm under which we lived was the threat of uh, nuclear exchange between us and the Soviet Union. Well, the new norm today in the 21st century, while we're dealing with sovereign threats, is the, is the potential of a terrorist attack. And I think we've ex we're accepting. I think the professionals are still focused. Uh, I do think from time to time we have to look over our shoulder and remember we can't afford to be complacent, but we shouldn't be breathless about it. Uh, we can deal with this. We've dealt with everything that's been thrown at this country for 200 years, so we can take care of ourselves. We don't live in fear. We live in freedom, and nobody in operating out of caves or in Pakistan or anybody else is going to take it away from us. Well, something that you instituted not long after you became the secretary was the color-coded system that John Napolitano recently nixed, right. uh, kind of maybe changed it um, it got a little bit of a flat, little bit of flack back then, <laughs> and flack throughout its entire tenure, really. Um, your thoughts on that? I think, in the in the context of uh, what has transpired in the ten years, that is, uh, the Secretary Napolitano's approach is the third iteration, actually. And one of the most important things for the administration or the secretary to do is communicate to the public. And let me take you back quickly. The first snapshot would be Attorney General Ashcroft, FBI Director Bob Mueller, and the Assistant of the President for Homeland Security, even before the department was created, holding a press conference at the Department of Justice saying, we think the threat tomorrow is greater than the threat today. We didn't give you any details. We didn't tell you what to do about it. And then we turn around and say, so be alert, be aware, situation awareness is important, bingo. I remember coming off after the third or fourth press conference, I toured a couple of aides of mine and said, this doesn't cut it. We have to tell America the nature of the threat, and then we have to tell them what to do about it. And by the way, states and locals said, come on, design a system. Uh, the private sector said design a system. And every, every color, and it could have been a number, it could have been anything, meant that there was a predetermined set of security measures you had to put in place. Apparently that never got quite ac across, else it would have been subject to so much ridicule. But having said that, it existed. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, whether there's two categories or five categories, two important ingredients, tell us about the threat, 
Tell us what it is to the extent you can, but more importantly, tell us precisely what you want us to do about it. So it's a third iteration. I think there's an evolution. There may be some changes down the road as well. Well, and you know, I, let's, I want to go back to that day because it, it's interesting. Flight 93 crashed in Pennsylvania, but Flight 93 made its turn over I-71 in Cleveland. Cleveland, that's And there right. is a flag above a, above, a, above a light pole that identifies the exact point at which oh it my. turned. I didn't know that. You didn't know that way, and no that. one knows it. When you drive down the highway, you see a flag above a light pole. That's all you see. But that's where Flight 93 turned sharply and came back to Pennsylvania when they were trying to crash it into, what, the U.S. Capitol building or the White House, one of the two. That day for you, when you knew that Pennsylvania had just become part of a tragic national story, you were the governor of Pennsylvania at the time. What was your initial instinct? What was your gut? What did you, what, what did you know to do as a leader? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's rather ironic. Maybe it's not ironic. I learned about that when we're having our interview right now. I was in Erie, Pennsylvania. I just pulled in the driveway into my home. I'd been down to visit my mother who was in the hospital. A state trooper had told me that the uh, Twin Towers had been hit by commercial airliners, obviously having been turned into missiles. I walked into the house, called my chief of staff, uh, and I'm watching and turn on NBC, hope you don't mind, uh, and Jim Mikulczewski, the reporter from the Pentagon, is just trying to put it all into context. Nobody really could at the time, and he said, and he abruptly ended his interview, he said, there's been a, an explosion on the other side of the Pentagon. I'm going to go vi investigate. Well, shortly thereafter, uh, the fourth airplane goes down in Shanksville, and uh, I had to wait uh, because... Uh, Norman Netta, Secretary Mineta, very appropriately grounded all aircraft, commercial and private. And it took me a couple of hours to get clearance to hop in a state police helicopter, get back to Harrisburg, uh, make sure my emergency operations center was uh, functioning. We pulled everybody in ASAP, and then I hopped in an old Army Chinook and hit it over to Shanksville. But my, I think my response that day was typical of most Americans. There was shock, the horror associated with that. Uh, you begin to grieve, but you're not sure. You, it, there's a certain level of anxiety, and then there's this, this real anger, you know, and, you, and, and, you, and, and, and this hope that at some point in time somebody's going to be held accountable. There's got to be retribution for these dastardly acts. And it was an evil, and uh, well, that was the, the events of that particular day. And, and just hours after that, you say you were in an in a, in a Army transport going to Shanksville. Um, when you got there, what were you expecting to see, and then what did you see? Were they the same or different? Like most Americans, the only familiarity with a crash site is what you see on television. And normally you see major pieces of wreckage, the wing, the fuselage, the tail, an engine. And I never f forget. I mean, I could literally close my eyes and see it. By and large, there's just this huge smoldering hole. That's it. I mean, we learned later the descent was over 500 miles an hour, um, but it was unlike anything I had anticipated. I mean, I think everybody in the helicopter as we, were, we came in, uh, we were absolutely shocked. I mean, it was just not we, what we had anticipated seeing. The other remarkable sight, uh, and it speaks not just to Pennsylvanians but Americans, was this scores of people in emergency vehicles, as soon as they heard the plane were down from all over central and western Pennsylvania, people rushed to the scene to see if they could help. And obviously, in shock and in grief and in dismay, they still were kind of wandering around, consoling one another, wondering what in the good Lord's name had happened. And you know, as the secretary, you have obviously been to the Pentagon Memorial that is there, un undoubtedly. Uh, what's happening in New York? You've been back to Shanksville. Uh, are you pleased with the progress of some of these memorials? I mean, when I was in Shanksville not so long ago, it didn't look like it looked like a construction site. It certainly didn't look like a memorial. Um, do you think that uh, our country's leadership should have been a little more on top of that, whether it was the Bush administration or the Obama administration taking all over the reins? Let's get these things done. Um, is, is it 10 years too long? No, I think there, uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to be patient about this. So we've asked uh, Americans uh, who are generous of heart and spirit many, many times throughout a year to write the check, and, and uh, we have a pretty ambitious goal for the, uh, for the Shanksville Memorial. It's about $60 million. We're, uh, we're probably 75%, uh, 80% uh, uh, there. Now, people have been very generous, and we knew it would take a while. But the beautiful thing of this is, is that both the, thanks to President Bush's administration and President Obama's administration, it's, it's going to be a part, it's going to be a national park. I mean, I'm very proud of that, of the three memorials 
uh, it is the only one that will be uh, overseen by the National Park Service, and they've been a great ally. And the other people that deserve a great deal of credit are the people in and around the Shanksville community. They've, they have been the docents. They have been the caretakers, and they've done a magnificent job. And there have been hundreds of thousands of visitors just for the, 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 the makeshift memorial. And when it's all said and done in a couple years, it'll have, it will have been worth the wait. Looking back to, uh, inevitably at one point, you got a phone call from then President George W. Bush mm -hmm. and said, hey, Tom, I need you to serve, and this is how I need you to do it. When you were down there at that joint session of Congress two weeks after 9-11, and you were asked to be in the gallery with the First Lady and stand and be identified as the man who was going to take the reins of our homeland security, what was that like? Well, there's a, there was a cascade of events all within about 24, 36 hours between the initial car, call from the Andy Carr, the Chief of Staff, and then the Vice President the day before and said the President would like to talk to you tonight about uh, coming to the White House with no job description. He just wants to talk to you about a role he thinks you should play and work with him in terms of helping uh, uh, make America safer. And I said, of course, I've talked to my friend, the President of the United States, but could he call me after 9 o'clock because I have to go to a funeral home to pay my respects to a friend? And then I talked to him briefly that night, saw him the next day, and I'll never forget this. We're in Andy Card's office. Andy Card is there again. The vice president's there, and then the president walks in and, uh, and uh, kind of says, Tom, I need somebody like you to do this, but you're the only you I know, uh, which makes it uh, uh, pretty difficult to say no. But I, I knew even from the night before. I mean, uh, it, it, I've known the president for a long time. He knew I loved being governor, but I also think he knew in his heart of hearts I couldn't say no. And even if he didn't realize that, the answer is, at a time of national crisis, when the president knocks on the door, whether you're Republican or Democrat, your answer is, yes, Mr. President, how can I serve? Now, ironically, we wrote the job description after I said yes, but that's another part <laughs> of the story. Well, you know, coming up uh, in not in two weeks, three weeks, it's going to be the 10-year anniversary. A lot of people have s still, and rightfully so, have security concerns. Al-Qaeda still plays a huge role in terrorism around the world. Um, is, is New York City, is, the Pen is Washington, D.C., are these places safe on the 10-year anniversary of 9-11? Well, I think there is going to be a natural elevation of anxiety around uh, in those cities throughout the country. I mean, it is a, a very significant time as we reflect on where we've gone over the past 10 years and frankly as we think of how we're going to deal with this scourge in the foreseeable future. So, uh, but uh, I recall early on, uh, early on giving a speech to a group or just having a conversation with a large group of people and one of the questions was, how do you sleep at night? And I said, I don't sleep very much, but I sleep well. And you know why I slept well? Because being on the inside, I knew everything that was going on every single day, literally by hundreds of thousands of people to make America safer and more secure. So if you had plans to visit to either any of those sites on September 10th or 11th, I'd say you go. I mean, we have ramped up as possible. As the, 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 sure, the anxiety, the concern will be high, but we, again, I use the word, let's not be breathless about it. This is America. Uh, we will do everything we can. We don't guarantee a fail-safe system, but uh, the world generally has been united. Most of the world is united to deal with this, uh, this global threat, and uh, I'd like to think that every day, every day during the past 10 years, we've done something or some things to make us safer and more secure, and I think, obviously, we're going to have to continue to do that, in my judgment, perhaps forever because we're not at war with a tactic, that's terrorism. We're at war against a belief system within the Muslim community, and obviously it takes very few people who embrace that ideology of hate, that ideology of evil, uh, to cause us harm. But uh, we'll deal with it. And, and in the same lines of coming up to this 10-year anniversary, the, the mastermind behind that of 9-11 is gone, and our SEALs took them out. We are responsible, finally, for being able to, to take him off the planet. That's a good thing. I don't think any American would disagree. Um, is it, is it, is it, in that, that day there were lots of celebrations. Is that something that we should be celebrating? Because it, it seemed to, I don't know, it, it was almost a little uncomfortable to watch some of the celebrations that were going on. It, it, I don't know. What, 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 what is your reaction to that? And as we're coming up to the yeah. tenure? It's a great question. I think, uh, there are several thoughts that come to my mind in response to, I think, your question. 
uh, we had been dogged and determined and persistent uh, to do what President Bush vowed that we would do. It carried over to a second administration. We will find the individual responsible and we will bring them to justice. And we did. Uh, was it to be celebrated? Yeah, I think to a certain extent I can understand the enthusiasm uh, expressed uh, that day and those evenings. But at the end of the day, I think we better temper it. Uh, I, I met Benazar Bhutto several months before she was assassinated in India, and I remember reading some of her writings before I had the opportunity to, to meet her and to talk with her. And she wrote one time that you can uh, imprison a man but not an idea, you can exile a man but not an idea, you can kill a man but not an idea. And, you know, the idea uh, that we're dealing with is a perverted uh, interpretation of the Koran. It's a, it's an idea. It's a belief system. It's a belief that you can use terrorism, and you shroud it some kind in some kind of religious uh, mantle to justify these heinous evil acts. And the belief system lives on, even though we killed the man. So we just uh, temper that celebration. I think it's pretty clear now, after a day or two, we finally back to the real reality that the norm is. He's been killed. Zawahiri has moved up. Frankly, sanctuaries have changed. There are other leaders who have emerged. And there are other forms of terrorism now uh, uh, rearing their head throughout the world. So we're going to be at this, and the world's going to be at this for quite some time. Well, uh, a uh, byproduct of 9-11 was the Department of Homeland Security, a first ever department in, uh, in our country's history. Um, what role do you see that department? You were the first head of that. Moving forward, it will, will we always need a Department of Homeland Security? Well, yes, we will. I mean, one of the ironies, and again, it, it really not too much coverage in the media generally, and nor should there have been, but for probably 20 or 25 years, there have been either think tanks in Washington or congressional studies that said, you know, in the, as we move into a, in a world that is more interdependent, interconnected, therefore more vulnerable, a greater opportunity globally, but because of that opportunity, uh, greater potential vulnerability. There have been several studies that said we need to build a, almost a, uh, uh, a border-centric agency. And obviously 9-11 uh, put an exclamation point on that need. And so yes, and people have asked, uh, should the same department, same bureaus and agencies be pulled together? Absolutely yes. But it's still going to take time to integrate, integrate all those different agencies. And so uh, I think I laid the foundation. Secretary Chertoff did his thing. Secretary Napolitano built up on that. Uh, but, you know, they still don't have a headquarters. Uh, they still don't have an opportunity to pull everybody, the chiefs, together in one central location. But they are, are making definite, definite strides. So what you're saying is in, in, in years before 9-11 happened, there was discussion. There were focus groups. There were things happening saying maybe we should do this. Yes, yeah, so for, for, for at least a decade or two before September 11th, there have been multiple studies suggesting, without concern about a terrorist attack, just the concern of the interconnectedness between the United States and the rest of the world, that we ought to monitor. We ought to know who's coming across our border. We ought to monitor the goods that are coming across our border. And uh, finally, the, 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 the catalyst was 9-11, uh, that's for sure. Hey, do you have any questions? Uh, are we still doing a good job trying to monitor what's going on in the world? Well, you know, one of the, uh, as I take a look back at the last 10 years and I look forward, there's still some things that I think need to be done. Some are very short term, some are still going to take some time, unfortunately. You know, right after 9-11, when we realized that firemen and policemen couldn't talk to one another, that we didn't have interoperable communications. I personally think it's an outrage that in this intervening 10 years, we still haven't pulled together the political will on both sides of the aisle and found the funding to build an interoperable broadband communication system, not just in anticipation of a terrorist attack, but what it would do for public safety generally if you could stream voice and video and data, number one. Get it, get it now. Congress quit talking about it. Start building. It's going to take a while. The uh, second concern that I have, we still don't do a very good job of monitoring. You know, we, we, t we take people's digital photographs and fingerprints when they come into the country. 
That's because two of the uh, hijackers who came in uh, overstayed their visa. We have no way of knowing if everybody that's come in whose picture we have has left. I mean, there are ways you can match against other databases, but I suspect there are several, several hundred thousand people, strong women in America, who probably have come in over the past uh, seven years once we set up the system uh, that are still here. And all we need is two or three. I mean, so they need to finish that in some form or another. Um, the other challenge I think we really have going forward is sharing information. You know, the Department of Homeland Security is a consumer of information. You don't generate the information. We rely on the FBI and the CIA and all the three-letter alphabet intelligence agencies. And we've seen recently a failure of that exchange. Uh, that individual got on the uh, plane and uh, almost detonated the bomb over Detroit. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security took some uh, grief because of that. They couldn't stop him internationally because his visa hadn't been yanked. The Department of State didn't tell the Department of Homeland Security that a father had come in and said, I think my son's been radicalized. Oh, by the way, he's in Yemen, and everybody in the community knows what, uh, what's going on in Yemen. Uh, Fort Hood, Major Hassan. Mm -hmm. I think it could have been avoided. The FBI in two different venues knew that he was... Uh, in contact with this radical cleric in Yemen and yet nothing was done. So at the end of the day, the intelligence agencies have to not only trust the Department of Homeland Security, they have to trust the governors and the big city police chiefs. Not that they're going to use it. I know in the age of WikiLeaks, uh, people were concerned, but you know, we went from a Cold War culture of need to know. Well, when you're fighting these terrorists, it's need to share. And information is only good if you share it and you need, if we can't trust Americans to help us combat, who, who are we going to trust? So I think uh, there's still, we've made a lot of progress with information sharing. I'm still not confident it's where it needs to be. Do you, uh, do you think we are at this point living on borrowed time for another terrorist attack to happen? Or are we, are we where we are today that there hasn't been a terrorist attack on our soil since 9-11, uh, 2001, because of all the systems set into place then and the systems that have grown since then? I know you just went through a whole listing of things that are still wrong, but are things, in, are things right enough that we have been the reason nothing has happened, or are we simply living on borrowed time that something's coming? It'll never be right enough. Okay. You can never create a fail-safe system. And in fact, we've been lucky on a couple of occasions. We were lucky over the skies of Detroit. We were lucky in the streets of New York City. Remember the observer saw the car burning? Well, he had executed the game plan. He just hadn't pulled together the uh, components correctly. So, and luck is not a strategy. In my world, thinking that we want to be good and we want to get better every day, and along the way, a little, little luck helps. So I've always op operated under the theory that it's going to happen again. We've demonstrated our resiliency. I don't think you're going to find the terrorists tricking commercial airliners and turning them into missiles. Uh, but the, even the nature of the terrorist, the profile of the terrorist has changed and the profile of terrorist attacks has changed. And if you take, look carefully at who's been arrested in, uh, over the past 18 months in the United States of America, you're going to see 60 or 70 either citizens, naturalized citizens of theirs here legally on visas. So you still have, now, in addition to international terrorists working their way here, you still have the homegrown terrorists. And uh, something they're going to wrestle with for quite some time. So there's a certain inevitability in my mind. You work every day to make sure it doesn't happen. And if it does, you respond immediately and lessons learned and apply them across the board.